harnessing the power of water has proven very useful in the generation of electricity. Acting like natural batteries, large bodies of water in conjunction with dams can provide many thousands of megawatts of electrical energy. However, like all sources of power, mishandling can end in disastrous results. Usually this channel doesn't tend to look at non-polluting power sources. However, the disaster we're looking at today took the lives of 74 people and caused millions of ruples worth of damage, so ticks most of the boxes for a plainly difficult video. Today we're looking at the catastrophic Sayanu Shashenskia power station accident and I'm going to rate it about here on my patented plainly difficult disaster scale. The Sayanu Shushenska power station is one of the world's largest hydroelectric sites and is Russia's largest. The plant has the potential to provide electricity for a city of over 3 million people, situated in Sayanogorsk, which is around here on a map. In 1960, a need for a hydroelectric plant on the Yenisei River was highlighted and surveys were undertaken to find the perfect location in 1961. Construction work began in 1963 on what would be the country's largest hydroelectric power station. The plant included the dam, reservoir and the power plant building. The first hydro project designed turbine was installed in 1978, with more turbines being installed in the following years and the whole project going online in 1985. The 242 metre high dam supports the Sayano Sushenska reservoir with an area of 31.34 kilometers cubed, with a useful capacity of 15.34 kilometers cubed. The plant has 10 640 megawatt 16 blade turbines, giving a total output of 6,400 megawatts. 70% of the electrical power created on site goes to United Company Rusals for smelters in Siberia. The turbines and their generators are housed inside a 950-foot vast turbine hall. The dam used at Sayeno Shishenskia was of the arch gravity type. This design curves upstream in a way that it directs most of the water pressure against the rock walls on each side of the canyon that the dam sits in. This provides force to compress the dam, improving its strength. Such is the design of the structure that the dam has a striking curve similar to the Hoover Dam in the USA. The need of a dam is to hold back the weight of the water kept in the reservoir behind it. This weight has a potential for electric power generation by harnessing a force that everything on Earth encounters, gravity. Electricity is produced by the opening of sluice gates on the reservoir side of the dam. Once open, the water flows down through the 620 foot long penstocks inside the structure. The water has a high energy caused by the weight of the remaining water inside the reservoir. The water is passed through a turbine, which in turn rotates, turning a generator. For fine tuning of the power produced by the plant, wicket gates are used and these surround the turbine. More or less power can be generated by these gates regulating the water flow and are vital in keeping control of the desired output. As well as varying power, these gates can be closed completely, essentially bypassing the turbine. After all this, the water is passed to an outlet gate to resume its flow down the river. Let's look at the turbine and its attached generator in more detail. Water flows in radially and exits actually. The rotational force from the flowing water through the turbine blades in the runner is transferred via a shaft to the turbine's generator. Attached to the shaft is a rotor which is made up of electromagnets around its perimeter. The electromagnets are made by circulating direct current through loops of wire around stacks of magnetic steel. Conductors are mounted around the outside inside a fixed stator. As the rotor rotates inside the stator, an electrical current is created. After this, the electricity is taken to a transformer, then to the power grid. The turbines used at the plant had a narrow band of efficient working. To reach the recommended megawatt power zone, where the turbine is most efficient, it has to transition through a not recommended zone at which excessive vibrations are generated. If the turbine's output power sits in the not recommended zone for too long, damage can be caused to the main bearing. These were split into four bands. Band 1 was the allowed band and was the lower end of the power spectrum. Next was band 2, 
also known as the not recommended zone. Then there was band 3, the recommended zone, then band 4, which was the forbidden zone. The vibrations were produced by the pulsation of the water flow and over time could wear down the turbine's mountings and bearings to a point that the unit would be unsafe to operate. The hydroelectric plant's lifetime has been mired with various issues. Many of the turbines experienced seal, vibration and bearing issues as well as several floods. Turbine 2 had its fair share of issues ever since its installation in 1979. This particular unit had seemed to have taken a lot of the brunt of the extreme forces put upon it during its operating life. As such, by the early 2000s it was showing its age with cracks in the turbine runner and issues with bearings were also highlighted and replaced. Between January and March 2009 the plant was undergoing modernisation. Part of this was the installation of a new automatic control system meant to slow or speed up the turbine to match output power demands. Once again, Turbine 2 had defects along its blades. Once the work had been completed, the runner had not been rebalanced, leading to vibrations once again. Although it was deemed within design specs, this vibration would wear down the bearings and mountings of the turbine. However, over the coming months, the vibrations soon began to exceed specifications. It was once again shut down for investigation. However, a strange turn of events would lead the plant down to the path of destruction. A fire alarm at the Bratsk hydroelectric plant on the 16th of August 2009. The fire took the plant offline and in response the Sayano Shushensky plant was ordered to take over the regulating duties. In order to pick up the slack the plant had to get as many turbines as possible online, including Turbine 2 which had been shut down due to the excess vibrations. By the 17th of August all but one of the turbines were pressed into action with units 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7 and 9 operating in regulating mode, with units 3, 8 and 10 generating baseload power. Unit 6 was shut down for maintenance work, and as such, more personnel than usual were in the turbine hall. Normally around 12 people staffed the vast building, but on that day, over 100 milled around the hall undertaking repair work. On the morning of the 17th, the output of unit 2 varied widely, and because of this, it sat for too long, in the dangerous band 2, aka the not recommended zone. The turbine began to vibrate, in doing so weakening its internal components. At 8.13am a loud bang ran out in the turbine hall. The turbine cover shot up, followed by the 920 ton rotor. The rotor still spinning, flew across the gallery destroying everything in its wake. The turbine was ejected from its pit under the 20 atmospheres of water pressure. Exposing the penstock, essentially there was now no barrier between the force of the reservoir water and the turbine hall. The monumental amount of water then began gushing into the turbine hall, flowing over the other turbines and their generators, shorting them out in the process. The control room became aware of the disaster as Unit 2's electrical power output dropped to zero, causing a local blackout. The water soon cut through the structural steel and the turbine gallery roof collapsed. Workers were washed away out of the building down into the river. Some were later rescued, however others were sadly not. The steel gates to the water intake pipes of the turbines weighing around 150 tonnes each were closed manually. These were held up by hydraulic jacks. The process would take at least 25 minutes. All whilst this was happening, water continued gushing out of the destroyed unit too. The emergency diesel generator was started and the spillway gates of the dam was opened. Units 7 and 6 continued to operate after their safety shutdown systems failed to trip. The turbines became submerged, causing damage to equipment and structures. Units 2, 7 and 9 were completely destroyed, with the remaining experiencing serious damage. Within 24 hours, over 1,500 rescue workers reached the plant, managing to save 14. In total, 75 personnel were lost during the event. The damage did not end with just the turbines and their generators, as over 100 metric tons of oil used on site was released into the river, causing severe environmental damage to local wildlife. By the 24th of August, the water inside the damaged buildings was pumped out and on the 28th of August, the search and rescue operation was completed. The repair works wouldn't be completed until 2014, costing well over $1 billion. But what caused Russia's largest hydroelectric dam to self-destruct? Sadly, the answer is unsurprising. 
and has played out many times in industries all over the world. Post-accident, an investigation was undertaken. During the probe into the cause of the disaster, retaining bolts were shown to have broken under stress. Worryingly, some of the bolts showed no sign of nut breaking, which meant that when they were installed, no nut was present. The unit was put on regulating mode when restarted on the 16th, meaning that the power output of the turbine would pass more times through the not recommended zone as it tried to match power demand. The operation of the turbine in the not recommended zone was not altered by the operators at the plant. The push to operate the unit in such an unsafe band was purely motivated by the fire at Bratsk Hydroelectric Plant to make up for the drop in power. This coupled with poor maintenance...